In turning our attention to biomechanics, it's important that you understand the SAC task for this incorporates both biomechanics and skill learning. Much the same as in your exam, there can be questions that will overlap areas of content. Skill learning and biomechanics do sit together very, very well. Um, and this slideshow, while it looks quite long and quite meaty, really just tries to unpack Newton's three laws, gives you some of the terminology of the concepts sit below that, and then sets you up for what's called a qualitative movement analysis. It is really just a four-step process or framework to setting up a, um, a structure or a model to improve skilled performance. The key knowledge here looks quite simple. There's a wealth of concepts and terminology and vocabulary to pick up sitting below this. Uh, but the biomechanical principles we're going to be looking at in this slideshow are underpinned by Newton's three laws of motion. And then the second part, the smaller part of this particular slideshow, is how we can set up a, a model or a framework to unpack what's important uh, biomechanically, if you like, and in terms of skill acquisition, when people are performing skills, so that we can set up a template um, or a pro forma to unpick what's going well and what's not going well in someone's skill execution. Two key questions again. Firstly, how do Newton's laws relate to sport and physical activity? And secondly, what are some key steps in improving technical skills? Or more accurately, what's a framework we can use to try to set up a way of observing and correcting technical um, skill proficiency? These guiding questions should be copied down and annotated as per an exam, um, and then use the PowerPoint and your textbooks and your peers and our learning activities to make sense of the key content, making sure you have this vocabulary to your word bank or your flashcards. Now, Newton's laws of motion mean that we must start with the term motion. So uh, motion is a pretty complicated concept. So here we're just looking at it as straightforward as we can, uh, talking about basically a body's position change um, in time. Um, and it can be described as linear, so all body parts moving in a straight line, hence the picture of the downhill skier without any movement, that would be linear movement, and angular, so about an axis. So the giant swing on the gymnastics um, horizontal bar there is a classic example of angular motion. Now I unpack those concepts much more fully next week when we look at motion and momentum, but essentially we're talking about a body's change in position over time. Here's a quick overview of the four types of motion we'll be looking at. The first three will be covered in this slideshow. Projectile motion will be covered next week. That's when we look at how uh, we can throw and kick uh, balls and objects to get maximum distance. Also throw our body through the air for things like high jump and uh, pole vault. But this slideshow is looking at linear motion, which is essentially straight line movement, angular motion, which is rotation movement, and then general motion, which is a combination of the two above, so straight and angular. And that tends to be pretty popular when we get from A to B. So running, swimming, cycling, rowing, all have a combination of angular and linear motion. Linear motion, as previously touched upon last week, is where all body parts move in the same direction at the same time. So importantly, um, for most of these examples, or all the examples I can think of, the athlete doesn't actually move per se. They don't move their joints. So the skier in this position here, that's linear motion, whether they're going down in a straight line or on a curved line. As long as they don't move their arms and their legs, that is linear motion. Here's another example of it in terms of this uh, speed skating. As long as they don't move their arms and their legs, we can call that curvy linear linear motion. So some more jargon here from one of the other textbooks. If it's straight line, we could call it rectilinear. If it's linear motion on the curved path, curvy linear. But importantly, the arms and the legs can't move about uh, their joints, which would then cause angular motion, in which case we'd have general motion because it would be a combination of the two. Angular motion could be called in layman's terms rotation, but try to use that angular motion term that's in the study design. It talks about when an athlete or an object rotates around an axis. So it's a circular path um, such that body parts will travel different distances at the same time. So these two examples here looks like swimming and something like gymnastics, classic examples of angular motion where different body parts travel different distances at the same time. If you have a look here, uh, the diagram is basically just showing you an internal joint for angular motion. That could be basically a biceps curl, but we're just dropping that looks like a block uh, 
opening up the angle of about 90 degrees. And it just reminds you there of angular displacement versus distance. Displacement is the change of position over time. And distance is just the territory or the ground that's covered in that time. In this case, because there is a change from start to finish, we have displacement and distance. So we've unpacked uh, linear and angular. And then we get a nice little break here. General motion is just a combination of the two. So pretty much any locomotive fundamental movement skill I can think of includes a relatively straight torso, um, but there's angular motion around the shoulder joint and hip joint. And then you've got your elbows and your knees, depending on the actual event that you're doing. So running, swimming and cycling are all general motion. Some factors to think about that influence motion, and you've seen these terms all before, but it might just be nice to stop and pause and start to make some connections. Um, mass, which remember is measured in kilograms, the amount of matter of an object. Weight, which is mass plus gravity, so thinking about the force that uh, gravity puts upon us. Inertia, which is a body's reluctance to change its state of motion, and you know that it's directly proportional to its mass. A higher mass is a higher inertia. And then forces will impact motion, uh, a push or a pull. So they can speed up or slow down. We would like to use positive acceleration and negative acceleration if we could. So there's some things that influence motion. Newton's first law, inertia, is the one word summary. So a body will remain at rest or in uniform motion unless acted upon by an external force. It's the most obvious of things you could ever think of. Uh, so the example there, a soccer ball will roll across the pitch until another player traps or kicks it, or ultimately once air resistance um, forces that ball to stop moving. Equally, a golf ball is not gonna move until a golfer applies an external force on it. So something will move once it's had some force applied to it until an external force acts on it. If I throw a ball to you and you catch it, that's an external force. But if I throw it into the air, both gravity and air resistance will ultimately bring that ball to ground, but the ball doesn't move until I apply a force to it. So inertia can be unpacked a little bit further, and that is a body's reluctance to change its state of motion, whether stationary or moving. So if we talk about things being inert, I suppose, they are just stationary. These two sumos won't move until they apply a force against the ground. And then ultimately, uh, you would say the bigger man has a bigger advantage in a, a game like sumo because he's got the larger mass, which makes his inertia harder to overcome. Yes, there's skill and technique and timing and strategy, but all things being equal, you'd rather be the bigger uh, sumo wrestler because increased mass, increased inertia, increased requirement of force to overcome that uh, body's reluctance to move. So in looking at inertia and talking about it being proportional to mass, it's important we take a moment to look at what mass is and then to have a look at what's often confused with it, which is the term weight. Certainly we use the terms interchangeably and incorrectly um, in everyday life when we go to jump on the scales and talk about our weight. Um, that's actually the force exerted by the Earth's gravity on an object. It's actually measured in Newtons in biomechanics. You can see from the formula out of your textbook that weight equals mass times gravity, but it is expressed in Newtons. So what we're doing when we're jumping on the scales is actually talking about our mass, which is the amount of matter that makes up an object, and that's measured in kilograms. So I'll give you the example there of the weightless uh, astronaut up in space, such that his mass would still be 75 kilograms, but that his weight measured in Newtons um, would be zero because there is weightlessness in gravity. Newton's second law of acceleration states that a force applied to an object will produce a change in motion in the direction of the applied force that is directly proportional to the size of that force. That can be expressed in the following formula. Uh, in terms of deriving the force. So force equals mass times acceleration. So mass, acceleration and force are all interwoven here. But Newton's second law is really talking about um, the direction of the force and the level of the force, the proportion of the force will impact the acceleration of the object, which is pretty straightforward. Depending on where you aim your um, arrow, it will go that way. And depending on how far you pull back the string, that'll have an impact on how the, the distance that the bow travels. Pretty straightforward stuff. Um, not surprisingly, it's inversely proportional to the mass because you then need a greater force to get the same acceleration. And that's the same principle of it's harder to move or accelerate a shot put compared to a tennis ball. 
In looking at the second law, it's important that we start to look at speed and velocity. And before we look at speed and velocity, we're going to look at distance versus displacement. So distance is just how much ground or how much territory an object actually covers, um, whereas displacement looks at the overall change of position. So the images I've got there are 100 metre, let's say it's a 100 metre men's race. So the distance there is 100 metres. Um, the displacement there is 100 metres. So they've covered 100 metres and they've changed their position by 100 metres. Conversely, the image below where the finish and the start line are the same. So let's imagine that's a 400 or an 800 or anything on the track that starts and finishes at the same spot. You'll cover that distance. And don't forget that in a 1500 metre race, you're not always running on the inside lane. You might be overtaking people and whatever else. So you might actually run a bit further, but that's the actual territory that you cover. The displacement, however, will be zero because your change of position from start to finish is, is negligible. There is none. There's no change of uh, position. So displacement is zilch. And what that means then is that distance and displacement allow us to generate different figures uh, that we might use synonymously um, in everyday conversation. But speed is distance over time. So you must have covered a distance to get a speed. A velocity a little bit more complicatedly. And you must have changed your position. So if you haven't changed your position, you can't generate a velocity. So the 400 meter and the 1500 meter at the conclusion of their race with displacement zero, have zero velocity. Even though they've covered 400 meters or 1500 meters, they can generate a speed, but not a velocity. And the reason we look at distance and displacement, which I mentioned in the study design, and speed and velocity, which I mentioned in the study design, is to just clarify further what this second law is all about. So the acceleration is the rate of change in velocity. Uh, it's measured in meters per second squared, sorry, meters per second squared. It can be positive, it can be negative. So if you're going faster or if you're going slower, that's positive or negative acceleration. And if acceleration is technically zero, then you're said to have a constant velocity. So the formula there for acceleration is a change in velocity over the change in time. Now we've been talking about forces for 14 slides now. Um, the definition is as simple as this, any pushing or pulling that tends to alter the state of motion of a body. Now we've previously looked at uh, the formula for their force equals mass times acceleration, so that you can see that acceleration is inextricably linked with force. That can be expressed as F equals MA, and again, this unit of measurement is in Newtons. So forces that I suppose serve to oppose motion or slow us down or form uh, negative acceleration, friction, when two surfaces come into contact with each other, gravity, which is a constant force pulling us or uh, pulling objects back down to earth, air resistance and fluid resistance. Now none of those are named um, explicitly in the study design, but force is named in the study design. So these slides here with the red text just say that while it's in your textbook, friction isn't mentioned by name in the study design, but it's likely that um, its connection to force could make it a possible question topic uh, for your exam. So friction is a force that opposes motion, and it's when there's essentially movement of one body over another. There's two types. The first one here is sliding friction. And you think about sports where you serve to increase or decrease it, and I suppose that's where the application part of the the content will come for your exam. So we can reduce it to um, allow us to go faster. So the snow skis or the um, ice skates, for example, they're a bit sharpened. Or we can try and do something to reduce it. So putting the wax on the surfboard to give us some bite with our feet on the board. So we can manipulate friction to um, serve our purposes. Other than sliding friction, there is rolling friction. So we're looking at balls mostly rolling over a surface. So something like soccer, lawn bowls, billiards, all that kind of stuff. Uh, for some of the sports, we can do something to manipulate it. Uh, for other sports, we just are mindful of the, how the two surfaces interplay. So there's a range of factors there that talk about um, how rolling friction will occur. Um, I'm not quite sure that uh, that'll pop up on your exam though. Gravity, again in red, a small fry thing at the moment, just explaining that it's the, it is a force and it pulls objects back down towards Earth. So pretty much for things that go in the air, and we look at projectile motion in a lot more detail a bit later in this uh, area of study, 
it just describes that parabolic flight path that we can get from a ball that if it's leaving the ground and returns to the same height on the ground, we get a true parabola. If we're hitting, it, hitting a ball up onto a raised surface, like in golf, for example, or down, if we're releasing a javelin from a higher point, it won't be a true parabola, but it will have that arc shape. That's gravity. Now, working hand in hand with gravity, but instead of, I guess, pushing directly down to Earth, uh, this is a force that goes in the opposite direction to the, the way the ball or the projectile is being thrown. So this is the front-on force, if you like, that will help, along with gravity, to eventually bring that particular projectile back down to Earth. Then if we start to move through water, we talk about fluid resistance. Um, look, this would be a pretty obscure question to get in your exam, but it is technically a force. Um, so if you're a swimmer, make some sense of this. You can see that swimmers are constantly trying to get an edge over the, the, the medium that they move through, which is the water. So all the things they do there with the shaving of the body hair and the swim caps and the swimsuits um, seeks to try to reduce that fluid resistance so they can cut their way through it as though it weren't there. Bringing us to Newton's third and final law. I don't know if you've got a favourite, but I quite like this one. Action, reaction. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Um, and we see that in life as we do in sport. Um, the two examples there in baseball, so the action is the bat striking the ball, the reaction is the ball goes, um, hopefully for a home run if you've hit it well. Uh, and then harder to see, but uh, something we do every day, we push back against the earth whenever we walk. Here this runner looks like they've left the block, so they're exerting a much greater force than we would when we walk. And we see them um, project themselves out of the block but because the earth is so large, we don't see much impact there. If it was on a trampoline, we'd get a good little image or something that was a bit like a putty or blue tack, we'd be able to see what's going backwards. Um, so that's action and reaction. While there's a thousand examples of Newton's third law, we might just in class bring a couple of uh, balls and see how the swivel chairs go. I wouldn't encourage you doing this at home, but I uh, typed in swivel chair and ball throw and I got this. So the young fellow there with the leaf blower in the Superman position, I would assume he's uh, swinging around there with quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of speed. So it just makes it easier for us to see the reaction to something um, where we normally don't in terms of if you're throwing a ball in a basketball game. Um, yes, yes, you see the ball move as a result of your force, but you don't see your body, I guess, pushing back um, in the opposite direction the way the ball goes. So we might try that. The QMA might be called something else in your SAC task or your exam, but essentially it's watching um, a performance. So it could be called a skill analysis. It certainly involves observation. Uh, eyeballing would, I suppose, be a colloquial term for it diagnosis or qualitative movement diagnosis. There are other terms, so don't be uh, put off if you see those in a question that's directing your attention to how we can describe the quality of a skilled performance. Now, the whole purpose of the, the principles that are to follow for qualitative movement analysis is that we want to try to improve skilled performance. So whether you're a teacher or a coach or a parent with their child in the backyard, um, what can we do to describe performance with a view to improving it? So certainly you want to try and pick up on strengths and weaknesses. So in, I suppose that regard, it's really just a different form. Of, it's a type of feedback. Um, you might, depending on your uh, context, be trying to get a result or a ranking if you're watching people perform. If you're doing like a selection criteria for an AGSV competition, hopefully those coaches or selectors come together. Um, what are the criteria they are using to select the 10 from the 15 or the 8 from the 12 that are there? Possibly also then talent identif identification. So what do the AIS and the VIS use when they are watching people perform skills? And it might also be a way to predict um, potential future outcomes. Here's just another way diagrammatically to show that loop or that connection. Certainly preparation is deliberately at the top of this um, little flow chart. So preparation first, followed by observation, then evaluation, and then error correction. And then I guess you would watch all over again, having already prepared the tool to evaluate and error correct. And so it goes just the same as your coach would do for you in your sports that you play, just the same as your PE teachers you've had across junior and middle school would be watching your performance and hopefully giving you some feedback to identify your strengths, weaknesses, and then plot a course to improve whatever you're working on.
So the first step is the preparation. So whether we're watching an overarm throw or we're watching a tumble turn in the swimming pool, or we're watching a discus throw in athletics, whatever the skill might be, uh, what are we using uh, to base our judgment on? Uh, where will we be actually observing from? What's the best position? How long am I gonna watch each person do it? And what are the success criteria of the skill? So it's setting up how I do what I do from where I do it um, to make sure that I've got some sort of a protocol uh, to follow to try and get some consistency. For example, if you're teaching or watching somebody do a um, basketball free throw, I would always set up a class or the teacher on the arm side of the person shooting. So if you've got a right-handed shooter, there's no point being on the left-hand side of them because you miss some of the success criteria or some of the key body positions. So those kinds of things would be crucial. And the observation is the actual doing of it. So is it going to be done in real time, which is the reality for most coaches and teachers in a school setting? You clearly need to know the game and the skills underpinning it uh, to form any sort of sense of accurate observation. You then need to apply your tool accurately. So depending on what you've come up with, you need to make sure that you're using that consistently and accurately with a view to trying to reduce personal opinion. Your whole idea of the observation here is to try to get something that six different PE teachers would see the same thing or record the same thing. And then certainly to record the data accurately. So to get it down, whether it's on video or on a clipboard. The evaluation, I suppose, is where the, the true skill comes in and watching somebody who continually gets bold in cricket, what is the root cause of that problem? In the case of this diagram, I would suggest they've chosen not to play a ball that they probably should have played. So it might be something to do with watching the ball uh, out of the bowler's hand. It might be a bit more about setting up for a defensive shot before raising their arms. It might be a bit more about body position and taking centre a bit more closer to the off stump rather than leg stump, all those kinds of things. Okay. If somebody's consistently serving the volleyball into the net, what's the problem? Is it strength? Is it ball toss? Is it position on the baseline? Is it not hitting in front of the striking shoulder, etc., etc.? What is the, the issue um, in terms of the performance? And then ultimately, what can we do to, to solve it? So once you've seen what's going well and what's not going so well, and almost everybody will have something they can tweak to improve. Um, it's really a matter of now setting the course for what they can do to be even better. So if they are at the autonomous stage of learning, what can they do to be even better? If at the cognitive stage of learning, what are the key pieces of information um, or practices that they're not putting into place that you want to suggest for them to work on? Whether it's the ball toss in the tennis serve, the foot placement on the tennis serve, whether it's the grip or the angle of the racket, whether it's the strike point of the ball on the racket, whether it's the positioning in the service box, all those things are what you would then direct that person to be working on. Uh, the second bullet point here says, depends where you are in terms of your training cycle or game phase. I suppose if you put it into a game context, there might be certain things to work on for the next quarter or for the next passage of play or possibly even for the next match, um, which just really makes your feedback all that more precise.